Let me pose to you an open-ended sentence this morning. One thing that is absolutely insane is, you can fill in the blank, I'm sure we're all creative enough to fill it in in a lot of different ways. In case you don't have any idea of how to fill it in, let me give you some suggestions. How about, first of all, someone skydiving to break the sound barrier? That was done recently. Someone dived from 24 miles up, managed to go fast enough to break the sound barrier and to land by parachute safely. Um, that's pretty insane as far as, as I can see. In fact, I thought that was kind of a Superman stunt, faster than a speeding bullet, but now apparently someone has been able to do that. If we want to talk about insane in terms of skydiving, how about skydiving without a parachute? Seen some of these kind of weird webbed type suits. <clears throat> I remember not too long ago seeing a guy who had a helmet cam who was doing this, who slammed into the side of a mountain and you see the thing jar and everything and somehow he recovered, he managed to, to live to tell about it. <clears throat> or maybe another idea of, of something insane, <clears throat> how about walking on a tightrope across Niagara Falls? As you know, that was also done recently and rather interesting, the, the man who did so professed his faith in Christ. It was really kind of an interesting thing. So all of these examples I've just given you seem at least a, a little bit, if not a lot, insane. But as insane as those things may sound and seem, they don't even come close to the ultimate of insanity. For that, we're going to have to take a look in Daniel chapter 4 to discover just what that is. So in Daniel chapter 4, the first three verses we read, Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now those words don't really sound all that insane. In fact, there's nothing that sounds insane in, in what we've just read. But what we're reading is the end result of, of something else. And so a flashback reveals, as we're going to study and read, what really is insane. So verses 4 and 5. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream, and it made me fearful. And these fantasies, as I lay on my bed, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. Well, Nebuchadnezzar seemed to have a knack for vivid dreams, which sounds a lot like chapter 2. And, and what he did in response sounds just like chapter 2 as well. Six and seven, so he says, I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in, and I related the dream to them but they could not make its interpretation known to me. Again, that sounds a lot like what we looked at in chapter 2. This old Nebuchadnezzar never learns his lessons. He calls in some of the so-called wisest people in his government, and they're unable to tell him what the dream is all about. You'd think he would just skip ahead to Daniel uh, in the first place. Uh, but anyway, verses 8 and 9, at least he wises up. But finally, Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I related the dream to him, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream, which I have seen along with its interpretation. Again, sounds similar to chapter 2. Tell me the dream. Tell me what it means. He recognizes that a, quote, spirit of the holy gods is in him. Well, Nebuchadnezzar's still got a few lessons to learn. So verses 10 to 17, we're not going to read this because this is a long chapter. You can kind of skim ahead and check this out. But there is the, the listing there, recording of the dream that he had. And to summarize it, it's a dream about a massive and a great tree. 
And as you look into those verses, an angel is given an order to chop it down, but special provision is made to make sure to preserve the stump of the tree. Now as you look at the details of the, of the dream, the tree partway through becomes a quote, him. And apparently this him, this individual, is to become insane for seven periods of time, as it says in verse 16. So verse 17, the purpose of the dream is stated. This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows on it whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. So there's a purpose to the dream. It's got something to do with Almighty God. And so that's the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar has asked Daniel to give an interpretation. Verse 19 and also verse 22. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while at his thought and his thoughts as his thoughts alarmed him and the king responded and said Belteshazzar do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you Belteshazzar replied my lord if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries verse 22 it is you O king for you have become great and grown strong and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. So, Nebuchadnezzar, the dream's all about you. And it's not a terribly pleasant dream because of what is going to happen to you. But, according to verse 27, it might be possible for this thing not to be fulfilled. So, verse 27, Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness, and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. So Daniel says, let me give you some advice, king. Some bad things are coming your way. But here's the possibility for things to be different. If you just simply repent, if you'll change your ways, if you'll humble yourself before God, maybe things aren't going to happen according to the dream. Apparently, however, Nebuchadnezzar did not change his mind or his heart because verses 28 to 32, it says, all this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, a year later, he's walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king reflected and said, is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power? And for the glory of my majesty, you pick up on the use of the word my there. He seems to use that quite a bit. While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared sovereignty has been removed from you. And you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beast of the field. You'll be given grass to eat like cattle and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. So the dream comes to fulfillment. As Nebuchadnezzar is going on about how great he is and the things that he has done, and so a decree comes about as the dream was all about. And so, like a madman, he goes out and he lives seven years like a beast in the field. Now, i got to pause for a moment and think about how it was with the government. How did things go on? The king, the president, if you will, has become a madman, and so he's out there with the cattle, he's out there in the field with the wild beasts, and you gotta wonder, what about the rest of the government officials? They're still left in charge, and so what about somebody that comes up and wants to do business with the king, and what did they say? Uh, the king, well, <clears throat> that field out there, the cattle, that's him out there grazing with them. Uh, that odd guy out there in the field, the, the guy that's hair's grown really long, who's got fingernails and toenails like claws of an eagle. Well, well you see, that's our king. That's him. Kind of an embarrassment, I would imagine, for the rest of the government. Seven years this way. I'm thinking he must have had a pretty good hold on his power because wouldn't you imagine in that amount of time somebody's going to say, the guy's nuts. I think I should be in charge. And so it, it seems like somebody should have taken over the government during that time, but again, it's all under the sovereignty of God. 
And so things continue on somehow for seven years. In this country, after four years, when you get ready for the election, you start taking a look at maybe we need a change or whatever. Seven years they put up with this, and nobody apparently tried to take over. And so that's the way it was with this mighty king. For seven years, he lives as a wild animal out there in the field. So then verse 34 to 37. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, mind you, he's writing all this, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, What have you done? At that time my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom, and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out, so I was established as my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. What an amazing conclusion to an extraordinary story. So as I reflect on this fourth chapter we've just looked at, it sounds to me like it is a mighty king's State of the Union address. Because you notice back at the beginning, he's addressed all the people of his government. And he's talking about the things that transpired, how in his pride he was humbled. He was made insane for seven years. That is the ultimate insanity, to be so puffed up with pride that God himself has to bring you down. And so he says, this is what happened to me, and this is what I have learned. And as your president, as your king, this is what I declare to you that I acknowledge the Most High God. He is supreme. I acknowledge Him, and I acknowledge a very important truth that I have had to learn the hard way, verse 37, that He is able to humble those who walk in pride. So what's the real takeaway from this? That's exactly it. That the insanity is to become so puffed up with pride that God has to do something drastic to bring one down such as it was with him. I was so filled with pride as the most powerful man in the world that God had to humble me, and God is well able to humble those who walk in pride. A few years ago, I wrote a devotional thought on this fourth chapter. I thought I'd share it with you this morning. I don't usually like to use myself as a reference, but I thought these words perhaps summarize well uh, what we've looked at. The ultimate madness is self-sufficiency. Those with abundant resources and abilities are especially prone. But there is a God who is well able to remind us of just how weak and helpless we really are. Exhibit A is King Nebuchadnezzar of long ago. Whether we have the means to build a luxury castle or just sand castle, we can believe too much in our own abilities. I enjoy woodworking, but I sometimes struggle with the satisfaction I find in what I make. Looking at the finished product, it is a struggle to balance an appreciation of God's ability through me with the belief that I made something with my own hands and abilities. After Nebuchadnezzar's seven-year insanity over his self-sufficiency, he acknowledged the supremacy of Creator God. It is extraordinary for a sovereign ruler to acknowledge one who is ultimately sovereign over him, but such was Nebuchadnezzar's confession. True insight led to the end of his insanity. The advances and accomplishments that surround us mask the insanity of self-sufficiency that rules in the hearts and minds of so many people. It is a tremendous struggle to seek humility and acknowledge our dependency upon our Father when so many worship at the throne of self. So for me, those were just a few lessons that I learned, that I walk away from, as I look here in Daniel chapter 4. Again, the ultimate insanity is pride. And self-sufficiency, I believe, is very closely associated with that pride. 
Again, Nebuchadnezzar is a, li a living, breathing object lesson to that truth. A truth we find in Proverbs 16, verse 18. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. If Nebuchadnezzar were alive in here, I'm sure he would have give, would give a very hearty amen to that. Or as James says in James chapter 4, verse 6, therefore it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Did God ever oppose a proud man more than Nebuchadnezzar? That's the most drastic step I think God has ever taken, at least according to Scripture. So indeed, God is opposed to the proud, but He certainly gives grace to those that are humble. Again, pride and self-sufficiency, I think, go hand in hand, and I believe they take a couple of forms. I think one of them is certainly the exaggerated estimation of one's own abilities. As Nebuchadnezzar said before the insanity came upon him, is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? Certainly an exaggerated opinion of who he was. But I think presuming about God is another form that goes into this in terms of pride and self-sufficiency. Nebuchadnezzar recognized something about Daniel's God. He knew that the God of Daniel was superior. But it seems like it took a good while before Nebuchadnezzar really knew truly something about that God. Before he recognized that the God of Daniel, the God of the descendants of Abraham, was the one true God and superior to all other gods. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn the lessons of Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5. Hear, O Israel! The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Nebuchadnezzar needed to learn that about the one true God. And even as Jesus had such a great burden for a similar truth recorded in John 17, verse 3, the night of his arrest and his betrayal, this is eternal life, that they may know you the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And so he had that burden, something that Nebuchadnezzar needed to learn and eventually did. And as Paul also had the same burden, 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Pride and self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency, I think, is easily that pride that trips us up in our modern day and age because we live in a very affluent society. So Nebuchadnezzar had his problems with pride and self-sufficiency, but we're not immune to the problems that he had. He said, I was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. Well, we may not have a palace, but you know the kind of homes that we have compared to what a lot of people have might as well be palaces. And so we can say the same thing. I was at ease in my house and I was flourishing in my palace. As Americans, we pretty much have the same privileges as well. Because I'm thinking it's not a daily routine for most of us, any of us, to go out and chop wood or to go out and hunt fresh game to make sure we got food on the table or to take our clothes out to the creek and beat them with stones so we got clean laundry. We certainly live the same kind of life of ease, and we flourish as Nebuchadnezzar did. We sit back at home in our easy chair with our remote with several hundred channels available to us, and we order our fast food or we microwave something real quick. All the while, the automatic washer and dryer take care of those menial tasks that people used to have to spend a lot of time doing. So we can relate, in a sense, to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, that doesn't mean that our cushy modern lifestyle guarantees that we are filled with pride or that we have self-sufficiency as Nebuchadnezzar had, but it is certainly an ongoing temptation for us because our stuff can very easily get in the way of our Creator. And so if it leads from he to me, then we certainly have a problem much like Nebuchadnezzar had. You know, we looked a few weeks ago in Daniel chapter 2. There was another dream he had, and there was an image that he saw of a metallic man of various kinds of metal. Nebuchadnezzar was identified as the head of gold, representing a, a form of governments that would extend throughout the ages. And he was called the head of gold, and so literally his government was the gold standard of government. There has never been a government that would equal his or that would ever come close to even trying to surpass his government. His is the best government that there ever has been. 
He was a dictator, and we know that there can be problems with dictators. But what I find refreshing in Daniel 4 is that he became a God-fearing government leader. And I think that is as close as the world will ever see to the perfect government this side of the rulership of Jesus Christ, who alone has a true understanding and appreciation of the Father and will rule that government as such. And so in a sense, we are not too far from the kingdom of God if we understand those things that Nebuchadnezzar finally came to realize, how great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from generation to generation. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are true and his ways just. And he is able to humble those who walk in pride. I think that we move away from the insanity of pride and self-sufficiency to true insight. When we can see these words and speak these words honestly from our hearts and our minds as well. Amen.